Greetings. The service is for the 13th Sunday after Pentecost for August 30th, 2020. Two more weeks and we're going to be moving back into face-to-face -face worship. Uh, September 13th, we plan to do conductor services at our regular times, but in-house. Uh, we fully are aware that many people will prefer to not meet face to face for a while, so we're going to be live streaming the 830 service and watch for more details about that. When you come back, it isn't going to be business as usual. There will be a very limited seating. You have to set where the elders and ushers instruct you to, and face masks will be required at first. Plus, there will be other protocols. The service for today, we begin with the opening verse. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our entrance hymn is In the Cross of Christ I Lord. This lesson also serves as the basis of today's sermon. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. 
Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Forever who would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will betray each person according to what he has done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We confess our common Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing a favorite of many, the old rugged cross. Oh, mm -hmm. 
words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. And grant, O oh Lord, that we learn two great lessons today. First, there's going to be suffering as Christians in this life. And also, O oh Lord, that there's a precious value to the soul, our soul. Not only are they important to us, but they're important to the Lord so much so that he sent Jesus to pay the price of our sin so that our souls could live forever in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear friends in Christ, it's been said, and there's a lot of truth in the saying, that you don't know when you're going to die. In other words, you should prepare to die at all times, because you don't know when the Lord will call you. But there are some precious souls who know that death might soon be drawing near. My father, toward the end of his life, he suffered from heart disease for about 20 years, and he knew that the doctors must have told him that his time was soon to draw to a close. And he went with my sister to a funeral home to make some of his final arrangements. It was one of those older funeral homes where the caskets were in the basement. And so they were headed down to the basement. But the first thing my sister did toward the top of the steps, she tripped and she rolled and tumbled down the steps. And uh, at the bottom, she started getting up and she was all right. But my, da my father was laughing at the top of the steps and said, we're here to make my arrangements, not yours. At least he had a sense of humor going into that. What we have here in our text for today is Jesus talking about his last arrangements. It didn't involve a funeral, but it involved that he would be suffer, that he would be betrayed, and that he would go to a cross and suffer and die. That was the heart and core of his mission in this world. It is also the heart and core of the gospel message. But we have another group in the text, the disciples, headed by Peter, who never did quite catch what was really essential. The disciples, you see, weren't ready to hear about Jesus' death. We read, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and he must be killed on the third day he be raised to life. That is a very clear picture of the heart and the core of the gospel message that's been preached for the last 2,000 years. It is the death of burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the that really conflicted with what the disciples thought the Messiah should do. You see, the, they thought the Messiah was just sort of a political thing. The big job of the Messiah was to throw out the Roman government that was so despised and so hated by all the Jews. And then, when Jesus had thrown them out, then the disciples and Jesus would reign from Jerusalem. That was the heart and the core of what they thought and believed that what motivated them to get up each day is they'd be part of this great political movement. And you know, the disciples never really caught it until after Jesus had ascended or after he had risen from the grave. The disciples and Jesus were, had a totally different idea of the Messiah. You see, Jesus didn't come to simply improve lives or simply to teach. He came to bear the sins of the world and suffer and die a high price for sin, death. Peter spoke of how, what the disciples thought of Jesus' idea of the kingdom. Peter took him, Jesus, aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. But who was Peter to tell Jesus, the Messiah, 
what was central in the kingdom of God. What, my friend, who are you to tell Jesus how much of him and you're going to believe in? What doctrines you can pick and choose? Not, you don't have a choice. In Jesus, you get it all. You don't get them on your terms. We can be highly critical of the disciples of this text, but we often make the same error and commit the same sin of the disciples. We try to make God out to be something other than what he is. We tend to think that God exists to simply to grant every blessing at our beckoning that we want. And in life, we're never to experience heartache or hardship. Life should be a breeze. It's that simple. We think that God's here just to bless us. And isn't that kind of the core of our prayers? We bring concerns to God about our health or a family member or those deeply impacted by the virus or the, the, the racial turmoil that sweeps our cities. Like the disciples, we failed to see the primary purpose of Jesus coming into this world was to bear sin, to suffer, to die, and to pay the great price for our souls. We also don't value the soul and spiritual life as we should. This world and the things of this world are oftentimes treated with greater value than the soul. But the soul and the price of the soul was critical to Jesus. It must have been hard for Peter and the disciples to hear that the kingdom would be radically different than their thoughts. The Messiah who dies bearing the sins of the world, dying the death of a criminal on a Roman cross of torture, of being buried and rising again from the grave, in fact, even up to the time of Jesus' ascension into heaven, the disciples were concerned about such things, like who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Now, our text also gives insights to us, 21st century followers of Jesus. To follow Jesus includes accepting suffering, if it is, if the Lord wills it. But life for most involves heartache and hardship. Life does not always go our way. Listen to Jesus. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any man comes after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life for me will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. Life oftentimes involves suffering in what we do with it. Long ago, I read a story of a pastor who was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And with the support of his wife, he went for treatments, but all medical efforts over the months failed. Facing his own death and the leaving of his wife, he said to his dear loving wife, we have just two choices. Either we accept what is ahead with grace and faith and ask God to see us through it, or we can become bitter. But we'll always have those choices. In the final analysis, each day we have the same basic choice. Accept life as we have it, with faith and with grace, or become a bitter soul. Jesus, who accompanies us throughout our lives, promises a better life in heaven. And so that makes it possible for us to accept whatever life throws at us with faith and have great hope, even in the most difficult of circumstances, because we know that if things don't get better here, we'll certainly have a better life in the world to come. That pastor outlined what it takes for us to endure suffering, see suffering, through the eyes of Jesus. And through the eyes of Jesus, our text tells us, we must deny ourselves. We always 
We think we should always receive blessings of God and never face a heartache at all. We have an inflated self-worth of ourselves. Like we don't, well, all we deserve are God's blessings. But our sins demand God's anger and punishment. The good news is this. Jesus Christ took our sin upon himself and he made the payment on our behalf. He took our punishment. He suffered. He died. He paid for that. And Jesus asked that we see the world through his eyes, from his perspective. Job, in the Bible, was the richest man in the world. And he had a large and dear family. But in the course of one afternoon, a windstorm came and wiped out his farm, crops, and livestock, and all his children perished. When Job's wife told him to curse God and die, Job said, We've accepted the good from the Lord, and now we have to accept the bad. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job was a man who looked at himself rightly. I may be the richest man in the world, but I don't deserve the blessings that God gives by his grace. Second, our text would tell us that we need to take up our cross and follow him. The cross here is not that physical cross that Jesus bore. The cross here are the burdens and the price involved in following Jesus. There are the daily challenges in life, chapter crosses. Then there are monumental events, like receiving the news of the death of a dear loved one, or the diagnosis of a dreaded disease. These, my friends, can become heavy burdens, backbreaking burdens, that crush our spirits and weigh heavily on the soul. They're crosses, burdens that need to be borne. But somehow in our suffering, we need to find the grace of God that assists us in carrying out our burdens and giving us encouragement along the way. The third thing that we need as a 21st century follower is following Jesus a constant daily activity because the soul is so valuable Jesus outlines for us what is at stake here. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? King James, what should it profit a man if he gaineth the whole world and left and yet lose his soul? The human soul is a valuable possession. It is the most valuable possession that we have. What we believe will make the difference between life in heaven or the torment of hell. The stakes are indeed high. When Jesus contemplated his own death, he saw it and all the suffering that it needs would be to take place to be the Messiah. But he did it for you. For the price of your soul was high, and he was so willing to pay. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us pray to the Lord. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we look at our lives, far too often we think of the things that we can feel, see, and touch. Too often we think of our daily burdens, and we forget that our soul is priceless, a great treasure, and that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ laid down his life on the cross, not just to make our lives better, but to cleanse our souls from sin and death and to pay for all of our sins. May we cling to that old rugged cross where the dearest and the best suffered and died, paid for our sins, and may that be the focus of our life, not of the things we have to possess, not our own personal happiness, but to find joy in Jesus. And O oh Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for those that are burdened with so many problems in the world today. We pray for the uh, civil unrest plaguing our nation, but now also plaguing our state in Kenosha. May hearts of all find a way to live in harmony with one another and seek justice through peaceful means. And O oh Lord, we pray for all that are impacted by COVID, for the sick, we ask you to be with them. For those who have passed on, that you would be as with and support families. Give researchers wisdom and how to create a vaccine that uh, would prevent the spread of this dread disease. And, oh Lord, we bring our silent petitions to throw before your throne of grace. O oh Lord, hear our prayers for the sake of him who suffered, died, and rose again for us, even our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and all of God's people said. Amen. We pray the collect of the day. Almighty God, your Son willingly endured the agony and shame of the cross for our redemption. Grant us courage to take up our cross daily and follow him wherever he leads and through the same Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we so may hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever fast the blessed hope of everlasting life through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray together the morning prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every year, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. And he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us. Amen.